Good morning and welcome back. Steve again. Southern Illinois is cool this morning. Got down into the 50s last night and about time to start turning on the heat. But unlike Northern Illinois, we don't have our color yet. Just starting to see the first, first changes in the leaves, but we're still green down here. The seeds started growing at my mother's funeral. Cousins had come that I had never met before. And the conversation turned to a dark episode in my mother's life during her childhood. Her parents had separated and her mom had moved back home to the farm, taking the children with her. And after a couple of weeks, her father, Noah, showed up. Everything seemed to be civil. He uh, got down on the floor and was playing with the kids. And then he announced that he was going to take my mom, who was three, maybe four at the time. He was going to take her and and she was going to leave, he was going to leave with her. An argument ensued, and before long, each parent had a hold of one of my mother's arms, and a tug of war was going on, and they were screaming, and my mom was wailing. Her grandmother, Grandma Berkey, had a hazel switch and was liberally applying it to both of the protagonists. Finally, Noah, her father, retreated out the door and everybody breathed a sigh of relief. But then they heard his footsteps again and he crashed through the door with a rifle in his hand. Some accounts say he pointed it at my mom. Some accounts say he aimed directly for Grandma Berkey. Regardless, he shot her. My mother's mother, Hulda, grabbed her and started to run. Noah clubbed her from behind with the rifle butt, splitting her scalp open. Blood was squirting everywhere, knocking her unconscious. As she fell, she collapsed on top of my mother, Tilly. When Grandpa Berkey came in from the field after hearing the rifle shots, he found Noah out by a corn crib. He'd shot himself in the head. Darkness. Noah was the, the person nobody wanted to talk about in our family history. He was the arch villain. He was evil incarnate. I'd heard the story before, it did not surprise me. Uh, and then one of my cousins spoke up and said, I've always wondered what part the horse had to play in that story. It took a moment for the comment to sink in. Uh, and then I was like, wait, what? Horse? There's no horse in the story. And so I asked, what do you mean? Well, it turns out that when Noah was a young child, maybe five, six, he got kicked by a horse, and the blow essentially scalped him. It, the, the blow hit him in the forehead, lifted not only his scalp, not only the skin, but the bone actually was broken, lifted up, and his straw hat was folded underneath right on top of his brain. Amazingly, he lived. His father paid for him to be taken to a university hospital. He stayed there for a long time. And when he came home, though, he was changed. Before the injury, he'd been a pleasant, happy child. 
easy to get along with. And now, at the least provocation or stress, or he would become violent. The family built a bubble around him to protect him from stress and, and kind of catered to his, his whims, anything to keep him from exploding. But that could only last for so long. Once he became an adolescent, he, he became restive and, and wanted to have a, be out in the world and trouble with the law ensued and, well, you know the end of the story. As I listened to my cousin telling the story, it reminded me of a classic medical case. Phineas Gage was a, an expl explosive supervisor on a road building crew in New England. And one day an accident occurred and a tamping rod used to tamp the explosives into the hole uh, got blown through his forehead and, and damaged the front part of his brain. He too experienced a radical personality change, impulsive, hot-tempered. Hot he ended up dying in a bar fight down in South America. And as I listened to my cousin's story, I could understand his question. What part did the horse play in that dark episode in my mother's life? I could only imagine the damage that had been done to my grandfather's brain by the kick of the horse. Last week, well, before we go to last week, but with that perception, that change in perception, what had changed? Grandma Berkey is still dead on the floor. Her daughter is unconscious and bleeding. My mother is, is squashed underneath of her, confused and traumatized. Noah is outside by the corn crib committing suicide. What has changed? And yet at the same time, I found within myself a change in perspective. A seed was growing that had not been there before. What do I call it? Compassion? Empathy? All of a sudden, Noah, who had been the arch-villain, the, the, the person I didn't want to think about in our family history, became an object of, well, I could relate to him. Last week, I talked about my perspective that sin has a physical component. Back in the 90s, medical researchers documented that adverse childhood experiences, of which my mother's is a, a powerful example, are a stronger predictor of whether we have a heart attack or develop diabetes or become uh, drug addicts than any other risk factors that we know of. Adverse childhood experiences strongly influence what happens to us later in life. Uh, other research showed that adults who have had those experiences have objective changes in their brains. The, the front part of their brain is smaller. The part of the brain that controls emotions is smaller on average. Another line of research showed that ACEs are associated with changes in our genetics. So these adverse childhood experiences, which nobody would argue are wrong, nobody would argue in Christian circles that child abuse or murder is sin. They ha affect us biologically. Nobody would argue that they are wrong, but our assessment of the results, the impact that they have on our lives, 
often stops with the mental. Well, you might have PTSD after going through something like this, but does it actually change you biologically? Today, medical researchers would respond with a resounding, yes, your brain is changed. When I've shared this information with people, I've, I've run into two patterns of reaction. The first has to do with accountability. So what you're saying is, if you've had a bad experience in your childhood, that justifies, excuses, uh, misbehaving later. Kind of like the innocent by virtue of insanity plea in court. I don't think accountability and compassion are mutually unacceptable, mutually exclusive. In fact, I think if we make them mutually exclusive, we dehumanize and demonize not only the perp, but ourselves. We dehumanize them by, by separating them from us, ourselves, and saying, they're not like me, they are evil. We dehumanize ourselves by making our humanity dependent on our performance. All it would take would be for me to misbehave, and you would think I was less than human. You see the effects of this all over in our society today. We are polarized because we dehumanize each other for the slightest of things. Political opinions, color of our skin, cutting in line at Walmart. The second pattern is the question, oh, well that sounds rational, but is it biblical? Well, let me just ask you a question. Does the Bible talk about sin being passed down from generation to generation? Does the Bible talk about sin damaging our bodies or our bodies trapping us in sin? Does the Bible talk about recreation becoming a new creature as being a necessary component of salvation? Jesus told his disciples, judge not, that you be not judged. Humanism tells us, you don't have to be wrong for me to be right. Both perspectives hinge on us giving a gift to the other person. In Christianity, we speak of it as grace. In humanism, we speak of it as tolerance. Regardless, we end up having common ground, a shared experience that allows compassion to exist at the same time as we are holding each other accountable for wrong behavior. Christians used to say, there but for the grace of God go I when they would see a drunk in a gutter or some other form of unacceptable behavior. I think that perspective is powerful. And my new understanding that sin has a biological component really empowers me to, to think that way. You and I may have different weaknesses because of our pasts. Not just our personal pasts, but the pasts of our ancestors. We may have different temptations, but they both arise from the same source. The trauma, the damage that sin does to human beings. So whether you're an addict or a gossip. Whether you cheat on your spouse or you overeat, 
whether you curse like a sailor or you are smug in your self-righteousness because you don't do any of these things, we're all in the same boat. We're damaged goods. That's what I find in the Gospel of Jesus. That's the way God looks at us. That's why he can have compassion for us at the same time as holding us accountable. And that is the challenge that Jesus gave his disciples. Love one another as I have loved you. He did not minimize the problems in people's lives, but he had compassion on them still. Has the seed been planted in your heart? Is the seed growing? Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.